Now, I said before, I think that uh, there are two tracks which are going. One is the COVID, the other is the environmental issue. And you can expect that the environmental issue is going to get more and more in the focus. It is already because of this conference that's coming up in November in Glasgow about the, uh, the climate and about environmentalism. I mentioned before a man called Klaus Schwab, who wrote something called The Great Reset. He reads the World Economic Forum, which brings together leaders of government, industry, media and education to work for a global solution to global problems. Uh, specifically relating to COVID and the environment through some form of, quote, effective global governance. So they're already saying that they want effective global governance. Does that thrill your heart with uh, joy and thanksgiving? Or does it make you feel a little bit concerned? Uh, he also made the connection between the COVID crisis and the Green New Deal. He said, at first, the pandemic and the environment might seem to be only distantly related cousins but they're much more closely and more intertwined than we think. Two common things about the COVID and the climate crisis. Both of them, they want to make people afraid of what's coming. Unless the government takes action, the action would then restrict some of your freedoms, but you've got to accept losing some of your freedoms because you're so afraid of what might happen if you don't. Uh, they use the fear tactic to get what they want. Uh, they're calling for drastic action to save the world. Uh, the IPCC, that's the UN's Climate uh, Committee, released a document calling for drastic action to save the world from catastrophic global warming. And they also have the uh, Church on board, Pope Francis, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Orthodox Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew issued a statement in the last few weeks calling on people of all faiths to take action against, to halt the devastating impact, impact of climate change. And as with COVID, the official church is generally playing along with what the government says. You'll find that they agree and they do what they're told and they play their part in enforcing government policy. They use the churches for vaccination pro pro programs and they're spreading the climate change message without preaching the gospel and certainly without teaching anything about Bible prophecy. So what about environmentalism? Now, I agree that we should take care of the natural world. That the first command in Genesis chapter 1 is to take, to, uh, take <coughs> God gave the man uh, the authority to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth, which implies some kind of concern and control over the, what takes place on the earth. Fortunately, the human race lost it, two chapters later, and the fall of man. But it still is our concern to care for the earth which God gave us. And we should do that. We should be concerned for the state of the earth. And we shouldn't be dumping, burning down forests, dumping plastic waste in the oceans, wiping out animal species and habitats. We should be caring for them. And it's certainly true that the world faces a number of environmental challenges with life-threatening droughts, floods and fires taking place. Having said that, I do have a problem with the green agenda because I think it's driven by other forces and a lot of it is actually not totally scientific that they tell you we're following the science. Uh, what they're telling you is that the climate change is caused by a heat blanket which is made by burning carbon which causes the heat to be trapped on the earth and raises temperatures. You heard that one? That's what uh, they tell you on BBC and the schools everywhere. Uh, and that causes temperatures to rise. The answer, therefore, is to stop burning carbon so that the temperature, uh, the heat can go out and not burn up the earth. Question mark whether it's true or not. Now, this is a little pamphlet I've got. It's, I've read it through. It's very complicated, and I can't say I totally understood it. It's called Climate, What We Know and We Don't Know. A lecture by a man called Prof Professor Murray Salby. He actually questions the whole thesis. Uh, he says that uh, the Earth's climate is incredibly complex. The sun, the ocean currents, the wind direction have much greater impact on the weather than human burning of fossil fuels. Natural forces coming from plant life in the ocean release a huge amount of carbon into the air naturally. And human contribution is quite small. In fact, he said it's almost like a drop in the ocean. So the carbon also comes down again without doing any harm. 
Uh, <coughs> and he gives a lot of diagrams, a lot of information, which is quite useful, quite difficult to follow, but quite interesting on the subject. Another one here, which Philip Foster also produced, called Is Global Warming True? Which is a little more easy to understand, but it gives you some of the question marks about this, whether it is all as totally scientifically proven as they're telling you. And that there are, again, serious scientists who question uh, much of what we're being told. Um, and they find that their information is then suppressed. You're not allowed to say it in your university. In fact, I think this man, uh, Professor Sabi, was a, in a university, I think, in Aust Australia. Lost his job after he did this. And you're finding that people who actually speak out on this subject, as on the COVID thing, find themselves in trouble with the authorities. Um, <clears throat> now, you have a lot of things which are saying we have the highest temperatures since records began. You heard that one? Uh, so when did records begin? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Uh, now, we don't have any accurate records of the temperature in past periods. Uh, the thermo thermometer was actually only invented by a man called Fahrenheit in 1709. It was not widely available around the world. You have no records of the weather in Americas prior to European settlement in the 17th century. And detailed records only began in the 20th century and mostly after the war, so in the latter part of this 20th century. We can tell from history and the records of history that uh, there have been much warmer periods in the past and much colder periods. Warmer periods such as in the time of the Roman Empire it appeared to be warmer. Uh, one of the famous stories of ancient Rome is of how Hannibal crossed over from North Africa with his elephants and then went over the Alps into Italy. Apparently, if he took that route today, it would be impossible because it's much colder and he couldn't get through the ice and snow in the Alps. Uh, we read also that in the uh, year 1000, roughly about 1000, the Vikings sailed from, uh, to Greenland and they grew barley and other crops in Greenland. You couldn't grow any crops today in Greenland. It's covered with ice. It's much too cold. Read also that in the Middle Ages they were growing vines for vineyards for growing wine in the north of England. Again, you can't do that in our time because it's much too cold. So we can deduce from this, although we don't have temperature records, that the weather was actually warmer in the past than it is today. We also know that the, temp the warm weather was colder in what they call the Little Ice Age. So in around uh, 1300, actually the temperature started to go down by the time we got to the 1600s, it was very much colder. So cold that the Thames River froze solid at London Bridge and they held ice fairs uh, on the Thames uh, without any danger of falling into the ice because the river had frozen solid. You ever seen the Thames freeze? No. Uh, so obviously the, temp the weather was much colder then. Uh, also the sea around Holland was uh, frozen and in France in 1789, they had a series of very cold summers and winters, which caused the harvest to fail, which was one of the causes of the French Revolution, because the peasants didn't have any food. Uh, so we can know from history that there were events when the time, times when the temperature was much colder than it is today. Was this caused by people burning fossil fuels? No, because they weren't doing it. So it had to be some other reason. Uh, one reason which has been proposed for why the temperature was colder in the Little Ice Age was what they call uh, the solar minimum, which meant there were no sunspots in the sun, uh, which caused the temperatures to be colder on the Earth. Interestingly, the present time, since I think about the last year or two, there has been a decrease in sunspots. In fact, now the sun is blank, there are no sunspots, which some are saying is going to cause the weather to be colder. They're also saying that the, with the absence of sunspots, Instead of the uh, wind blowing, uh, according to the jet stream, generally from west to east in a, sink, in a straight line, the wind is now blowing much more in a wavy line. So if it blows in a wavy line like that, the jet stream is going to bring up warm weather from some parts, mm. so some parts will be much warmer than usual, and cold weather from others, so other parts will be much colder than usual. That's exactly what's happening at the present time. So although you see pictures of forest fires in West coast of America, in the Mediterranean area, much hotter weather. Other parts, it's actually colder than usual. Uh, <coughs> in fact, the, temp the summer here was colder than usual. We had a lot of north winds. So it, we didn't really have much global warming 
in this country at this time. But other parts did have global warming. And one of the things which is true at the present time is that uh, there isn't universal global warming all over the Earth. If the global warming theory uh, that there's this heat blanket trapping it, there should be universal uh, warming, is not the case. You've actually got a lot of colder weather in certain places, and this uh, is affecting how <coughs> affecting the climate. Um, in fact, I'll give you some examples. Uh, the sea temperatures is colder in the China Sea, in the Atlantic Ocean, Northern Atlantic Ocean, and in the Pacific. It sounds colder weather. Uh, although the BBC, I thought I saw a paper just programmed just today saying that the ice is melting in the Antarctic, uh, some are saying it's not actually, it's growing. And also in the Arctic, they, said, they used to say quite confidently that by this time the Arctic would be ice free. It's not. <laughs> The ice is actually growing in some parts of the Arctic and it's not universally colder. Um, Europe, North America and Asia had record cold weather last winter which continued into the spring causing serious problems for farmers. And in the southern winter which is from June to about August in the southern hemisphere weather has been much colder than usual in South America, South Africa, Australia and New Zealand. In fact, unusual cold has brought a failure of the crops to Brazil and also to Kenya, apparently. Um, also, the changes in the ocean currents which are affecting the weather, especially what they call the El Nino or La Nina uh, phenomenon in the Pacific Ocean. La Nina brings colder weather to the surface of the Pacific, which is affecting the weather. Present time, there's a strong La Nina, which means we may have a cold winter uh, here. So, don't be too surprised if the weather's colder. Now this kind of information doesn't get out to people generally. It's not on the news. You don't see it on the BBC. You'll only see stuff about warmer weather, not about colder weather. Why is that? Well, they want you to be so afraid of global warming that you'll accept the change to the way we live by cutting down coal, oil and gas, uh, which we need to run our electricity and transport system and they also want ultimately some kind of authority over nations on a global scale to sort this out. But if you listen to what the UN is saying, they're saying that this is what needs to happen. A man called Guterres, UN Secretary General Guterres, gave a speech just uh, on September the 10th. He spoke about the need, the fact that the human race is facing a perfect storm of simultaneous crises, including the pandemic and climate change, and he called for multilateralism with teeth. What does that mean? What it means is a globalist government bodies would take binding legal authority over what they call global public goods, which is basically the environment, uh, which means that they would promote a common agenda with centralised planning at global levels called Agenda 21 or Agenda 30. Uh, Klaus Schwab in his uh, global reset is saying exactly the same things. And in fact, they've been saying this for a long time. Uh, if you look at history, at recent history, you'll find some very interesting, I've got, dug these quotes up, from wealthy globalists who've been working on this project for some time. There's a group called the Club of Rome. 1993, they said, in searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the bill. Humanity requires a common motivation, nam namely a common adversary, in order to realise world government. doesn't matter if the common enemy is a real one or an inventive one for the purpose. Get that? It doesn't matter if it's a real one or an inventive one. What we need is something to fear, something to unite humanity, so they'll accept some kind of global government. A man called Ottomar Edenhofer, he was the co-chair of the UN International Government on Climate Change, Panel on Climate Change, from 2008 to 2015. He says, we redistribute de facto the world's wealth by climate policy. Basically, it's a big mistake to discuss climate policy separately from the major themes of globalization. One has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. It has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. It's about redistributing the world's goods, some kind of a socialist uh, program for world government. Another man called Dr. 
John Holdren, who was actually the sort of climate advisor to Barack Obama when he was uh, president, says a transnational, trans, transnational planetary regime should assume control of the global economy and also dictate the most intimate details of Americans' lives using an armed international police force. Sounds helpful, doesn't it? That was a book called Your Echo Science, which he wrote. And finally, a man called Daniel Botkin, who's a professor of this subject, said the only way to get our society to truly change is to frighten people with the possibility of a catastrophe. In other words, frighten people into submission, then you get your way. And a lot of young people have taken this on board. You think of Greta Thunberg telling uh, the UN and people that they've stolen her future. And we've got to go to zero carbon in order to save the world from this catastrophe that is coming. Uh, if you went her way, which is to shut down, move to zero carbon, you'd actually have to shut down uh, basically our society, ban cars and planes, bring in radical changes to agriculture, industry and transport, which would lead to no food, no jobs, no money, and freezing to death in the winter. But even the partial measures they're bringing in are going to gradually bring this to pass, and you're going to see a gradual sh lockdown on these things, which will contribute to more and more economic problems for our nations, and also increase poverty in the developing world. One of the results of all this is actually that uh, developing nations in Africa and other places have been sort of cut out of developing industry because uh, they don't want to increase climate change, which means that often the people are kept in much greater poverty than they need to be, and dependency. So does the Bible say there will be a crisis in the environment? Yes, it does. Is it one of the last day's prophecies? Yes, it is. Um, a number of prophecies. I think I've mentioned these before. I just mentioned one or two. Book of Isaiah, chapter 24, it says, The earth lies defiled or polluted under its inhabitants. It's verse 5. Therefore the curses devour the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. Romans chapter 8, uh, Paul writes, The whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs, as it eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. Uh, the revealing of the sons of God is the second coming of Jesus. So it says that this time is going to be groaning in, with birth pangs. And Jesus spoke of the time of the end when he said, quote, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon and in the stars, on the earth, just, on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts fading them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Uh, so Jesus spoke about signs uh, in the heavens and also on the earth, distress of nations, the sea and the waves roaring, whether that means some kind of storms or floods uh, taking place. So these are things that are going to be happening in the last days which are going to cause people to be afraid of what's coming on the earth. Uh, Revelation 8, we also read about trees being burnt up, fish dying in the sea, waters polluted, being undrinkable, the sun being blotted out. And in chapter 16, it says, men are scorched with great heat from the sun. If you look at these calamities as they're described in Bible prophecy, they actually don't imply man-made disasters, but a cosmic shaking of the earth. Uh, in fact, with judgments of God being poured out. One of the things Jesus spoke about is signs in the sun, the moon and the stars. And there are actually some interesting things you can note in this. Uh, in Revelation 8 verse 7, uh, it says, The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood. They were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Uh, read an article in the Prophecy Newswatch, which said that uh, this particular description here perfectly describes what would happen if a coronal mass ejection or a solar flare, a major one, was to hit the earth straight on. First of all, it would cause a penetration of the earth with very cold weather from space, which would cause hail, first thing, followed by fire, which would then destroy everything which, living which was in its path, so there'd be blood, uh, whether the animals or any humans in the way would be killed, and then the earth the trees and the grass being burned up. So it describes a solar flare. What would happen if a major solar flare hit the Earth? Apparently one came within about a day or two of hitting the Earth in 2012. Uh, NASA didn't want to tell us too much about it because people might get scared. And mercifully it hasn't happened yet. But if it did happen and they're worried about something's happening in the sun, that would be exactly what would happen. 
Uh, signs in the Moon. Uh, NASA also noted that there's been a potential wobble in the Moon's orbit, which could happen at any time, and is happening at the present time. If the Moon was to wobble in its orbit, it affects the tides, uh, and the effect would be to cause an increase in high tides, which could cause flooding of coastal regions, uh, the sea and the waves roaring, including cities of London, like London and New York going underwater. Signs in the stars. Uh, news have just come in of a very large comet entering the solar system. Come by the Earth in the next few years. Hopefully it won't hit the Earth. But they are worried about asteroids hitting the Earth and the possibility of what would happen if one did. Revelation 8 says, Something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the f- sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. Uh, could also describe an asteroid hitting the Earth. So the end-time prophecies actually do speak about kind of catastrophes happening, and some of the things happening now are kind of forerunners of that taking place. But if you look at these things in the context of the Bible, they're not actually the result of human activity. They're the result of things happening in the cosmos, which is changing what happens on the Earth. And to be honest, there's nothing we can do about them. We can't stop them from happening. We can only pray to God that they don't happen and pray that God will protect us. And in the end, the only solution is going to be Jesus coming back to sort out the state of the earth and renew what has been destroyed.